if you have ever been with a hijack or one of those toxic, difficult people I talk about, you know how they like to exploit your vulnerabilities. They'll even laugh at your weaknesses. And today I'm going to be talking with Kim Said. She is an internationally respected self-help author and an educator specializing in recovery and rebuilding after toxic relationships. So you can just imagine we are going to have a great conversation. Stay tuned. Welcome to Save Your Sanity Podcast. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. Are you living with the chaos, confusion, and uncertainty that a toxic person loves to create? Is a partner, parent, ex, sibling, child, or coworker causing you to second guess yourself? That can be crazy making. I'm here to help you save your sanity. So let's get down to it and figure some things out now. Stay tuned. So excited, as usual, to have a guest that I really appreciate what she's doing in the world. This is Kim Said. She has written so many wonderful things, and I'm sure you'll learn so much more about her and want to read what she's written, too. Welcome to the program, Kim. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Shaler. I was really excited to get your invitation. I know this is going to be a lot of fun. It is, and it's going to be tremendously informative because we come from different points of view on this. I mean, we're certainly aligned, but we come from different places in our interest in this. So this is great. Let me tell people about you. Uh, Kim Said is an internationally respected self-help author and educator specializing in recovery and rebuilding after toxic relationships. So we know about that. She's the founder of Let Me Reach, a life transformation site that teaches people to flourish after narcissistic abuse. She's the author of the Kindle bestseller, How to Do No Contact Like a Boss, which, yay, people (laughs) need to know. So, so many things. So tell me, what is it that caused you to focus on this area of work? Well, Dr. Shaler, I guess you could say there's no better experience or no better education than experience. I was in a narcissistically abusive relationship for about eight years. Actually, I was married to him, and I also share a son with him, and uh, this wasn't really what I had planned to do with my life. It just sort of happened. I uh, had gone back to school to get my degree um, in teaching and that's what I did for about three years and during that time is well there were always problems in the marriage but during the those three years that I was teaching some really um, intense things happened at which point I left the marriage left the relationship got my own place and started doing research and that's when I discovered uh, the concept of narcissism and what I had gone through. And at that time, this was about eight years ago, there wasn't really a lot of information out there. So I had to do a lot of um, deep digging. I went to seven different therapists. No one had a clue about what I had experienced or how to help me. Mm -hmm. And so that's how Let Me Reach was born. If we've had the experience, now I've had it too. I was raised in a hijackal family. No hijackal is my term so that we don't use clinical diagnoses for people. Because I I really don't think, Kim, it's a great idea for people to go to Google and put in whatever's happening to them and they get a clinical term back and say, well, they're a narcissist or an antisocial or a histrionic or a borderline. And then you you create this distance which says, okay, well, they're that and that's the problem. But, you know, we have to remember we're the one in the relationship, so uh, we're right. going on too. So I Absolutely. create that term hijack. Um, I like that term. And I have um, started, you know, really advocating for the fact that we don't really need to stay uh, hooked on these these labels you know what we really need to pay attention to is the climate of the relationship and if the relationship is abusive and is if it is causing you to have problems in your life and even with your own uh, health Um, so really we don't want to get too hung up on uh, labels Mm -hmm. Um, but there are some checklists out there that help people determine if someone is narcissistic you know, a lot of narcissists are not even ever uh, diagnosed. So it's really up to us to take responsibility. 
Right. And, you know, I certainly agree with all that. Where my consideration is coming from the psychological side of all this is that we can see somebody who has certain tendencies and behaviors and attitudes. And so if we recognize that they, uh, there's a group of people who have these patterns, traits, and cycles, and they fall into this pool, and all hijackals drink from the same pool, we really don't need those psychological diagnoses or labels to say, okay, well, you are that. Because unless you're in my business, you really don't know how to diagnose that. So a checklist is a great help. Um, and yes, diagnosis is great, but hijackals think they're really wonderful and perfect and above going to get Absolutely. Absolutely. So they're not going to get a diagnosis. And, you know, what the research tells us is that only about a small percentage, maybe 10, 12 percent of people who have these issues going on actually ever are clinically diagnosed. That's and true. They're not going to get help um, because they don't want help. There's nothing wrong with them. They're right. perfect and wonderful. And and we should all believe that, too. So right. that's why I created the term hijackles. And so we can talk about them. We can talk about that whole pool of traits they drink from. And we can also recognize then that we're, we're in that. We've got the opportunity now to say, okay, I find myself in this situation. Now that I've woken up and smelled the herbal tea, what am I going to do about it? And right. so you got into this um, by life experience. I got into it, first of all, um, thinking that I just needed to learn to help people manage conflict. And as, of course, it's a very long time ago and a long time I've been doing this work. But as I grew into it and realized, oh, my goodness, that's exactly what happened to me. You know, you think 30 years ago, people weren't talking about this. And so there wasn't any help. Right. And so it's so good that there are people like you who are speaking up and offering things and writing about it and all. And, you know, I think if we if we think about hijackals and we think about that particular subset that behave like narcissists, what do you think is the biggest misconception about these folks? I think the biggest misconception that I have come across and I get, you know, comments on my YouTube channel, on my blog and my emails that, um, you know, well, these people can't really help the way they are. So we should try to offer them some understanding and patience and um, go from there. Maybe we can help them heal their, their traits and become a better person. Mm -hmm. And um, this is simply not the case. As you said, in most, I've never seen someone who, uh, you know, some people have been diagnosed as narcissistic, um, or maybe they just match the, the behavioral traits. Um, I've never seen or heard of a single case where they improved over the long term. They can definitely improve for the short term because they're trying to, um, they have an agenda, mm -hmm. um, but I've never seen it happen for the long term. So the biggest misconception is that they don't really mean to hurt other people. Um, mm -hmm. And I really don't agree with that based on my own personal experience, my research and the people that I've worked with. I would, I would certainly agree with that, and I would have a caveat about that. Okay. Because what I know is that when I'm working with a couple, or I end up working with them as individuals, sometimes people mimic hijackal behaviors. That's the only tools they have in their toolkit, and they're not hardwired that way. So very occasionally, maybe five or six percent are actually people in that category. So they will change. It, they will, it'll take a long time to change, but they will change if they stick with it and get help over time. But I absolutely agree with you overall. These people have had trauma, impact, negativity, adverse childhood experiences, childhood emotional neglect. They've had things going on in their past during the time of their brain growth. And right. th those things are locked in there. They don't know other ways of being. It's not like they get up in the morning, except for about 4% of them. Not like they get up in the morning and say, how can I make my wife's day miserable? 
This is right. the way they do life. This is how they know to survive. They're, they're, of course, that little percent, they're probably going to be end up in life imprisonment or death row. But <laughs> those ones are, are looking for ways to do nasty things, you know. Um, Hannibal Lecter over there, right? Right. Uh, but um, they really aren't staying up night figuring out how to make your life miserable. This is just them doing what they have learned to do. And that's why they don't change. Well, and you're right. I've actually written about that in several of my articles that they're not real well, ex except for the ones like you mentioned, the ones considered malignant or toxic. Uh, they're not really sitting around strategizing about how to hurt people. But it's certainly not unintentional, meaning that they don't care that they're hurting people, the people that are close to them in their circle. And they're certainly at least in my experience, not sitting around wondering, how can I be a better partner? How can I be a better friend? So, yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah. We, we want to be, we're good people. Most people who get involved with hijackals are good people. They and are. they want to be compassionate. They want to go the extra mile. They want to help and nourish and nurture. They want to be supportive. They want to be that compassionate person who will be there and, and demonstrate that. And so they are that. But what happens, as you write about, as I write about, is a hijackal goes, whoa, great, got a live one here. I'm just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and get more and more of what I want, and, and that'll be perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's not going to be much reciprocation unless they want something or they're hoovering, you know, the term that we use to try to get someone back in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And they're very good at that because if they have not got enough supply in the wings, and let's put a caveat in here for everybody, hijackals have supply. They either have actual supply or prospects <laughs> that they've been grooming. So they can go somewhere else if you don't give them what they need. Now, right. Yeah, so it's important to know that, that if you say I'm leaving or you're leaving to a hijackal, they will do one of two things. They will either switch into love bombing and come back and want to be the most wonderful person that you met in the first place and fell in love with for that brief period of time that you mentioned, <laughs> or they will go to the, the supply and make you the scum of the earth and do a smear campaign and tell everybody how awful you are. What kind yeah. of experiences have you learned with that in mind? You're absolutely right. You know, a lot of people, well, I mean, I can't really categorize everyone that I hear from and I read, you know, their emails and everything, but I have come across a lot of men and women who don't believe that their spouse or their, you know, their partner is cheating. Um, but there, as you said, there's always someone in the pipeline. And if they're not already in a secret relationship with that person already. So as you said, absolutely, they're going to go and enter into a new relationship or just pick up the one that they've been stringing along for a while. Mm -hmm. um, or if they don't have someone readily available, then yeah, they'll come back with a love bombing. But um, it's not because they miss you, it's because they miss what you were giving them. And a lot of us can't really, when you're in that fight or flight mode every day and you're trauma bonded and you're just dying for that person to be back in your life, we make up stories about why they're coming back. But the truth is, in my experience, it's never because they miss the person and want to, you know, make things right. It's just so they can get back into that convenient atmosphere and get all those wonderful things they were getting to begin with. Mm -hmm. And they've groomed you already. They know how to manipulate you. And so why go and learn somebody else when they come back <laughs> to you, right? I've written about that before. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're creatures of economy. And that's why, you know, I see people writing in on the forums, well, they, they took the new supply to our favorite restaurant or took yeah. them on our vacation spot. It's because they don't want to have to put in a lot of effort. It's not because... They're trying to get back at you necessarily. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's just because it's more convenient. They don't have to put any thought into it. Yeah, it worked with the other one, so it'll work again. <laughs> you know? Right. And, you know, this is sad. I mean, certainly I just laughed then, but it's really shadow laughter that these people are so dark and conniving in that way and not conniving from the point of view of individual instances but simply that's their way of being like how do right. i make everything work to my advantage how do i get what i want with the least possible effort then you know i do graphics three or four times a week kim and one of the really popular ones is is a very sad picture and it says Never think that a hijackal has love to give you. They have uses for you. And it's so important for us to recognize that we are fulfilling a need for them that they are now using us to fulfill. That's the meaning of the word supply when we're talking about that. And right. so the more that we will make ourselves into a pretzel or a doormat, the happier they are because they're keeping us in uncertainty and chaos. And those are two of the hallmarks of hijackles. You know, you say to a, a, a hijackal, well, what do you think we go for a picnic on Saturday? And the hijackal says, well, that's a good idea. And you think you're going for a picnic on Saturday. So on Saturday, when you get out the picnic basket, the hijackal says, what do you think you're doing? Well, you said we could go for a picnic today. No, I just said it was a picnic was a good idea. Right. So yeah. now I've told you may have told the children we're going to go for a picnic. We're all of that. And now you look bad in front of the children and they have by keeping this chaos and uncertainty and ambiguity about what you're going to do. They have every right to say, well, I never agreed to going to a picnic on Saturday. And when you replay that, you realize that you just thought the inference was there. And so yeah. these kind of nasty things that they do. So I think it's important, um, you know, you, you mentioned that there's a real story there about underneath what people believe are empathic narcissists, which seems like a complete oxymoron. Can you talk it about does. that? Yeah, you know, and this kind of ties into our earlier uh, discussion about Stop trying to analyze the kind of narcissist or, you know, in your case, hijack all that person is. Stop it because you will run yourself ragged for months and years. Now, when, you know, I have seen, well, out there on, you know, very popular websites about the empathic narcissist. And, um, you know, people have all these different uh, descriptions and explanations and definitions about that. So we want to talk about the three basic kinds of empathy, which is the emotional empathy, where we can feel another person's emotions. If they're upset, maybe they lost a pet. We can feel that, that pain. Or we have compassionate empathy, where maybe we see someone in a burning building and we want to help them out, or we see them drowning and we want to offer them a, you know, a long stick so we can save them out of the water. But then there's something called cognitive empathy, where a person can learn another person's wants, needs, desires, and understand what they can do to get what they want out of them without any of the human emotions that go along with that. And so these, this is the same kind of cognitive empathy that is used in police interrogations or even um, people who are torturers to understand how better to hurt someone. So that's the kind of empathy the narcissist uses or the hijackle when they're in a relationship with us, which makes it seem like sometimes they really care about us, but that is not the case at all. Um, they're just learning our, our deepest wounds, our emotional buttons, so they can use them against us later. Such a good insight. You know, that's so important for everybody to sit with for a moment because you want to believe that this person loves you. You want to believe they have your best interest at heart. You want to believe they're really the person they showed you in the beginning, that they love bombed you with, that they were a chameleon and seemed to know everything that you needed and wanted and knew your soul. And, you know, it's so very, very difficult. And then when you put those terms around it, cognitive empathy like I've got you figured out babe and I will make you twist in the wind right yes. and that's really what they are thinking like yay I got this one <laughs> nailed you know and and it's so important to know 
it's so important to know that, yeah, there's theory about this, but just think about that concept that Kim was so wisely giving you. And let me also remind you that my guest today is Kim Saeed from LetMeReach.com, um, really a brilliant author, and she's done so much to move everybody forward in understanding what's going on with narcissistic abuse. So the understanding that there is something um, in this cognitive empathy that is so twisted. Yeah. So, it's really dark. Yeah. It is really dark. And now, you know, I'm hoping that anyone who hears um, this interview really takes that to heart and really sits and thinks on that for a while. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where once you learn it, you can't unlearn it. Yeah. So how, you know, I'm hoping that this will help people make educated decisions about their relationships, romantic or otherwise, so they can stop being a target of emotional and verbal abuse. Yes, absolutely. And let's just say something about the otherwise outside of romantic relationships. Uh, I work with people in romantic relationships, of course, and in marriages and things. I also work in the corporate world, but I particularly work also with people who were the children of hijackals and they didn't really realize what had been implanting within them and they wonder why they are having particular kinds of relationship difficulties inability to succeed as an entrepreneur or in a career or to get the life that they want and it's so important to go back and find out how was I treated? What was I told about who I am? How was I manipulated perhaps by a parent so that the parent could have control and power over me? What What's your insights around being from a home where a hijackal was a parent? I think it's good that you brought that up. Uh, I think that abusive parenting or neglectful parenting certainly uh, instills trauma in a young mind that does affect them basically for the rest of their lives unless they um, are, you know, are not really willing, but they're just unaware that this is the dynamic they had growing up. Um, and I think it's also important to point out that we can become, um, you know, I hate to use the term codependent, but we can have these uh, toxic relationship patterns, even if our parents weren't abusive. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, it could be that maybe they were perfectionists. So if you didn't get straight A's on your report card, then you were not given affection. Or maybe there was a parent who was in the military who was gone all the time. Or maybe it was a move when you were in the first grade and you lost all your friends. So these are the things that traumatize young children as you said during their early um, developmental years so it doesn't always have to be an abusive parent but a lot of times you know that's the case and mm -hmm. we do you know I think Sigmund Freud had that term um, repetition compulsion where we just keep repeating the same patterns over and over trying to rectify the original situation right. um, and that's why it's so extremely difficult to get out of these toxic relationships because we find ourselves not able to rectify the situation, but we're looking to the outside to fix it when really we need to fix inside of ourselves mm -hmm. to be able to get through that. Right. I, I did a video this morning about don't beat yourself up if you find that you've been in a relationship with a hijackal or a narcissist or, you know, any one of these people with these traits and patterns. Um, just go from the moment that you're in and say, okay, I see it now. And don't say, oh, why didn't I listen to all these people yeah. who told me? Don't don't bother with that. So you, you brought up a really beautiful point. Thank you for that. And before we go, I'd like to ask you this question because I know how frequently it shows up in my Facebook groups. Okay. And I'd love to hear your answer to it is, why does a hijackal or a narcissist, and you speak about narcissists, um, why do they tell you how much they hate you and yet they don't want you to go anywhere? Why aren't they just happy to get rid of you? Well, it's, it, it ties into what we talked about a little bit earlier. You know, the, at least with narcissistic individuals, they view love as a weakness. And over time, um, they find our nurturing personalities and our loving personalities to be somewhat repulsive 
but at the same time, it allows them to extract copious amounts of narcissistic supply or hijackal supply, uh, which makes life very convenient for them. So even though they might not even like you as an individual and could possibly even hate you, which I want to kind of back up and say, don't take that personally. It's not you. It's, it, it can be anyone that they're in a relationship with. Um, that knowing that we love them in that way uh, lets them know that they can exploit us pretty much until the end of time, unless we take that stance and leave the relationship. All right. So important for everybody to realize that when somebody says, I love you after they've told you that I hate you, I have a word about that. You know, I used to have a very large suite of offices. I don't have them anymore. But the most important thing that I can teach anybody was written on the wall in 12-inch gold letters, Kim. <laughs> and what it said was this, the truth is what you do. And I coined that phrase because it's so important. Believe their behaviors, not their words. So important. I've, I've said that too. And I don't say it enough, but it's absolutely true. You cannot, when you find yourself in a relationship like that and the red flags are popping up all over the place, you cannot listen to a person's words. When, the youth, when they have um, violated your trust and they have traumatized you emotionally, you cannot trust their words at all. And that's I hope is one thing that will help people make that educated decision to do something about it. You mm -hmm. know, it's not, you know, we can't take the responsibility for having been abused like that. But once we realize what's happening, it is our responsibility to then do something about it. Yes. And remember what I said earlier, we can't do anything about it till we have that moment. You know, and there is usually for somebody yeah. a defining moment that all of a sudden Absolutely. all the fog clears and they go, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> right. And no matter how many voices from the past come chiming in at that moment, they told me, they told me, they told me. It's not until that moment happens. And that's your moment when you can do things differently. Right. And and knowing that. You know, really coming to that moment when finally the penny drops and you say, no more. I get it. No more. And so you've shed some really great light on this and you do that in your work. Remember, everybody go to letmereach.com and uh, find out all the good that Kim has for you there. She has a free gift and that is the Beginner's Healing Toolkit. You can find it on our website and you will find the link for it in the show notes for today's show. So you don't have to worry that you won't find it easily. Do you have a few words of wisdom to leave everybody with today? I do. I think, um, you know, as you were talking about a little while ago, people um, beat themselves up a lot. You know, I wish I'd known this so long ago. And I just, you know, there is a period of self-loathing that happens for most people when they do finally leave that relationship. I went through that. It probably lasted a whole year. But I just want people to understand that this has nothing to do with intelligence, that it all, ha it, you know, all those wounds, the abandonment wounds, the trauma lies within our subconscious mind. That is what the um, toxic person is targeting when they uh, take advantage of us. And, you know, that's how trauma bonding forms. And that is the reason it, that it's so difficult to leave these relationships. So don't take personal responsibility for that. No, oh, such wise advice. And thank you so much for being with me today, Kim. No, well, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. I've been talking with Kim Saeed, and she is a um, self-help author, and she has gold for you, specializing in recovering and rebuilding your life after toxic relationships. Find her at letmereach.com. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor, and if you want to interact with me, go to forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com, or my YouTube channel by the same name, For Relationship Help. Talk soon. Thank you for joining me on the Savior Sanity Podcast today. I hope you've had some new insights, 
some ideas and strategies to help you gain clarity and confidence for moving forward toward greater emotional health and safety. You deserve that, and so do your children. If you found value here and would like to support this podcast with a dollar or five each month, please do so at patreon.com slash save your sanity. Learn more about how to work with me by a video conference, join my optimized circles, or subscribe to this podcast on my YouTube channel at my website, transformingrelationship.com. Talk soon.